Just 20 kilometers off our coast of Perth is a beautiful island we call Rotnest. It's quite a special place, and many of us like to get away from the hustle of city life and enjoy nature at its finest. The way most of us get there is by ferry, a relatively affordable, if not slow and often bumpy way to go. So a decade ago, when I met my wife Felicity, and we were just starting to date, I thought, oh, I'll take her to Rotnest, won't that be nice? Not so much to Felicity, as she, she suffers from seasickness. So a 45-minute journey on the open ocean is not her idea of a good date. But uh, look, I thought, well, we could do this differently. Why don't we fly? So I looked it up, and yeah, we could catch an air taxi. Okay? So out to impress her, I booked the flight, and off we went. And I realized, actually, it's a great way to go. It's over three times faster. There's no uh, queues and no check-in and, and you know, piling on a boat with everyone else. And it was on demand. And you had the whole aircraft to ourselves, along with our pilot, Frank, who also happened to be the owner of the business. The only downsides was that it cost more than twice as much, and I couldn't help feeling guilty about the emissions of the petrol engine burning leaded aviation gas, especially when visiting such an ecologically sensitive island. So over the years, I got to know Frank, and we went with him very regularly whenever we could justify the price. And I realized that, you know, it's not him jacking up the prices, it's the cost of his business. So the fuel and the maintenance of these old engines and aircraft is really challenging to keep a sustainable business. And he runs a very lean operation. So I realized there's a larger picture at play here, beyond just a small business in Perth. The general aviation community around the world are struggling with these cost burdens and making a viable business. Given it had failed to modernize and the engine technology was over 60 years old, I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. I've been working in drone technology over the last decade, and that technology has been improving exponentially. And aviation has failed to modernize. It was really due for disruption. To solve these difficult issues, we often have to think in first principles, look at it differently, and work out how we can solve them with new insights and sometimes it can surprise you. When you think about aircraft in first principles and forgetting any preconceptions of what they used to be like, you can do it differently. Yes, you need to move the air fundamentally from the forward to the back and push the aircraft through the air, and that can be done with a propeller, but actually propellers are quite inefficient. If you look at the turbulent noise that you get from a propeller, we can't see this normally, but with computational fluid dynamics, you're realizing that over 30% of the energy is wasted in turbulence. So how do you smooth that flow? Well, with a ducted fan. And you see them in commercial airliners all the time, but why don't you see them in light aircraft? It's the big vibrating hulk of engines. They get in the way of what would otherwise be a nice clean airflow path. And these limitations have plagued the light aviation industry for over a century since the dawn of the Wright brothers' first flight. Propellers have been powered by internal combustion engines. And these are what the engines look like, just to remind you how complicated they are with all the moving parts. They're really inefficient, and people don't realize this, that over 70% of the energy is wasted in heat and noise, as opposed to a little electric motor that has less than 10% in heat and zero noise. This is a seven times less waste. It's a game changer in terms of efficiency and environmental friendliness. And also, if you didn't notice, they're quite small. So they don't block the flow of these ducted fans, and it can allow us to access this technology. When new disruptive technologies come along, it opens new horizons of what you can do to really disrupt an industry and think differently about aircraft design. If you think of first principles again, if we're trying to get lift, there are fixed wings you see in commercial aircraft, but they need a minimum airspeed and runways. So now if you want to take off vertically, you have to think, how do I get that lift? Well, in a helicopter, they use large open blades, which many of you, I think, will realize is quite dangerous and a little scary. And if we were to invent a helicopter now, we'd look at it and go, so you've got hundreds of moving parts wanting to separate from each other, and you've trusted some engineers to, and some maintenance people to make sure that doesn't happen? No thanks. <laughs> so really, again, how do we do vertical lift differently? Well, that's where ducted fans can also help, because they're much more efficient in hover as well as forward flight. By moving the flow of air through the fan more efficiently 
and getting that extra 30% of energy back, we actually can make aircraft smaller and more compact and much safer. So over the years of developing uh, ducted fans for drones, I thought, surely this technology can scale up. And I started developing them for light aviation, for recreational aircraft and training aircraft. And when I was asked to present this technology at an electric aviation symposium in the US, uh, they said, oh, why don't you bring a ducted fan along and, and show us what you're doing? Well, my business partner at the time uh, thought a bit more ambitiously than that. Rob was like, oh, it's only three months away. Let's build a whole new aircraft. <laughs> thought, OK, well, we'll give it a go. So uh, Rob, as a true innovator, started building this aircraft in his garage in California. And uh, I was helping him remotely when I could. Uh, but it was only one week before the symposium that I showed up with a suitcase full of electronics and we installed all the uh, batteries and motors like a mad scientist trying to get it all done, uh, the fly-by-wire control system as well. And what we ended up with was something we called Flycart. It's a single-seat, <laughs> vertical taker for landing aircraft. So it has eight ducted fans distributed around the cockpit and it's probably like nothing you've seen before. So just the day before the symposium, we managed to get it flying, and this is our flight test, where we took off, hovered, and could land safely with no problems. We even turned off one of the fans to demonstrate how stable it can be with just seven fans running. And this is really exciting, because we're realizing you don't have to have single points of failure that could bring an aircraft down. The other fans can keep flying, even if you have an ingested object or if you have a mechanical failure. So it turns out we weren't the only people thinking this way. There was a global competition announced called the Go Fly Challenge with a prize pool of up to two million US dollars. So we thought, all right, we'll jazz up the design a bit, <laughs> put a few more fancy lines in, <laughs> chuckle a couple of extra fans on the back for good measure, and we got Flycart 2. The exciting thing is we actually won the top 10 design awards for this aircraft. <laughs> Now, the electric advancements allow us to rethink how we develop these aircraft and think outside the box of conventional aviation. And these other engineers that we engage with talking about our ducted fan technology have even crazier ideas and a really exciting aircraft that they're developing. Here's an example of a really cool transitioning motorcycle. It starts off as a motorcycle, and when you want to take off, you just fold the fans out, take off like a gyrocopter. And other ways of flying are really fascinating. If you can now tilt the ducted fans upwards and take off vertically and then transition to forward flight, you can fly substantially faster and no longer need runways. This aircraft is the XTI TriFan, originally conceived as a twin turboshaft engine with complicated gearboxes and drive shafts feeding all of those fans. It was going to cost a fortune to design and manufacture and for the customers to buy. But when they started exploring electric propulsion, they realized they could do this aircraft differently. With electric motors in each duct and only wires instead of drive shafts, they could substantially reduce the development cost, the actual final cost and operation cost, halving the price of this aircraft to the industry and accelerating the uptake with over 60 pre-orders after announcing that change. Now, there are many, many new designs out there, far too many for me to convey to you in just one little talk, but the reality is that the science fiction dreams of our childhood are now possible. And the really exciting thing is how we're going to use this technology. So Uber are actually getting into this space, and they see this is the next way of transporting people. So being able to actually fly San Francisco to San Jose in only 15 minutes, instead of driving for 100 minutes from the ground, is a game changer for urban transportation. This exciting new industry is getting so much momentum that big players are all getting into it. And they're proposing that within five years, Uber are going to have vertical takeoff and landing electric air taxis transporting up to four people with pilots on board, so don't worry. <laughs> However, they're that confident that within 10 years, they'll be able to take the pilot out and the aircraft will fly itself fully autonomously. These modern designs seem so far away from what we know as conventional aircraft, yet we'll soon be seeing them become a reality. We're at the dawn of the electric aviation age. Now, this year, Australia became the first country in the world to actually certify an electric light sport aircraft. 
And we're the first company operating this service for flight training right here in Perth, down at Jandicott. So this is it, the Alpha Electro. While it looks like a conventional airframe, don't let that fool you, it's got amazing technology inside. The electric motor and batteries are so much simpler and cost so much little to fuel compared to petrol that we can try a substantially more affordable flight training. And it flies for up to 60 minutes, more than enough for a typical flight for training, and it can fly up to 200 kilometers an hour. So you're flying substantially faster, yet using a lot less energy than automotives. It's very quiet, you can't hear it above 1,000 feet, you have to kind of pay attention and look for it, in fact. And it's zero emissions, which is the most important thing to this industry. This is just the beginning, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and this is just the beginning. Four-seat aircraft that can take passengers to Rotnest are within a couple of years away from being certified. And we can really rethink what this is going to do. So when you look at what Frank could do with his air taxi business, flying to Rotnest and charging off the sun, you've got a completely sustainable and affordable ecosystem for transporting people to that beautiful island. But what could this electric aviation mean for our way of life and our communities? Imagine a one-hour trip by road, now only taking 15 minutes. What could we do with this extra time in our day? And it could transform where we choose to live. So if we could fly further, faster, and at a lower cost, would we choose a tree change, possibly live outside of the cities? Perhaps more dispersed cities, allowing a more friendly environment for people to live and work. Now, electric aviation era has begun, and we need to start thinking how it will change our lives and what we do now to embrace it. A future where you can choose to fly in an electric air taxi is no longer a question of if, but when. Thank you.